Zlows is in the building. One of the greatest rock photographers ever, Mr. Neil Zlozauer, is sitting in Studio 2. How are you, buddy? Thanks for that intro, Drew. Very uh, becoming. I got to keep the energy up to match your amazing okay. voice. Yeah, well, I got a lot of energy for an old dude. Have you ever been kind of contacted about doing voiceover work? No, not really. But you no. could see like in a cartoon I, or something. Yeah, where you're like, I they, guess I could. Everybody's like knows when I'm talking. So, <laughs> how many times have people fucked up your name in your whole life? Oh, my whole life, <laughs> hundreds of thousands. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, as everybody knows, and we're kind of been talking about Van Halen so much. Um, you know the famous shots that were done in this room. We were just discussing the one over there in the corner, and you got all those David Lee Roth ones at the mural that used to be out in the courtyard there, right. and you know. I want to talk about your life a little bit because it's not just about Van Halen or about the 10,000 other artists that you photographed. But you're from L.A. You were born in the Valley? No, born in Fairfax. Fairfax District. Okay. I know your dad had a liquor store in Burbank, though, right? Burbank, yep. Yeah. And then you were shooting a lot of the Hasidic Jews. You liked that's kind of. Yeah, weird. yeah. They always fascinated me, you know. Yeah. So used to walk down Fairfax with my camera and shoot them. What was the first picture you had published that was kind of like, holy shit, I'm fucking awesome? From what I remember, I think it was a Richie Blackmore photo in Guitar Player magazine. It had Wes Montgomery on the cover. Wow. It must have been like 71, I believe, right around there. And did you submit that, or did they contact you? I forgot. I used to work with a good friend of mine from junior high called, uh, his name was Todd Gray, and we sort of had a team that would go to shows. We had these phony backstage passes that we used to make. And uh, so we, we, Todd always had the big mouth, and I was the better photographer, if you ask me, you know, but I was sort of a shy little innocent kid back then. So Todd was the, the good bullshitter and he'd go and he'd somehow get his passes or the phony passes at first. But he probably somehow contacted Guitar Magazine back then uh, and we submitted some photos. I mean, back then the whole magazine scene was a lot different than it became in the 80s. And plus, there weren't a lot of people shooting rock shows back then. I mean, most wow. of those people now are dead, yeah. you know, so. What's it mean to be from Los Angeles? Do you love living here? Do you love the city? I love living here. I mean, all my friends are moving to Las Vegas or moving to Nashville. Florida. They want to escape the taxes. But I've lived here all my life. I mean, this is home to me. You know, you got... I could drive 45 minutes and be at the beach. I could drive a couple hours, be in the desert, Palm Springs. You could drive a couple hours, be in the snow in the mountains. It's yeah. great. It's so crazy that back in those days, you know, there wasn't social media. There wasn't anything. It was, and that's why I, I respect and try to promote people like yourself because you facilitated these artists and elevated them because your picture would go to the kid in South Bend, Indiana, that's never been to Los Angeles and is obsessed with Van Halen or Guns N' Roses, and they'd see your image. Right. And that's it comes alive for them that way. And it's, it's you know, stained in their skull for the rest of their lives, right. that image, yeah. especially the one in here. Well, well, even when I was a kid, I started off as a fan before I was ever a photographer. And I'd go up to this record shop on Hollywood and Wilcox called Lewin's Record Paradise. And they used to sell... English imported records, but the LPs back then for the imports were seven dollars. An oh, American wow. record was three dollars. <laughs> well, I barely had three dollars, let alone the seven dollars to buy the imports. But what that store did have was eight by ten glossies of the Rolling Stones and the Beatles and those bands. So me and my friend would take the bus. And we'd go into Lewins and, you know, we'd look at the photos and we were like little kids in a candy store and like, oh, look at Keith. He's so cool. And look at Brian Jones hair and Mick. And we'd buy a few eight by tens and we'd come back and we'd put them on our bedroom walls at our parents' house where we lived at the time. So I started off as a fan, too. Yeah. You know. Those were the golden years, don't you think? I mean, what do you think about today's society? And just, is there really rock stars anymore? Well, there's no rock stars anymore. I mean, there's a few good rock bands. Uh, as a matter of fact, I heard from one of my uh, favorite guitarists and one of my favorite bands, Scott Holiday, who plays guitar on Rival Sons, and they just happen to be coming to L.A., I think, next week. So I asked Scott if I could come down and see the band, who I love that band. They're phenomenal. Where are they playing? 
Uh, someone told me, not Scott, I think they're either playing House of Blues and the Wiltern, but I can't stand going to rock shows at the Wiltern. It's the one of the worst places Why in is my that? Well, it's so unionized that they're like, don't step here, don't touch this, don't lean on the stage, don't kneel down here. I'm not going to shoot it. I'm just going to go yeah. watch the show because I don't shoot photos anymore. That's a waste of time if you ask me. But I want to enjoy the show. I'm trying to, in my old age, I'm trying to relive all the shows that I really missed when I had a camera or five cameras hanging around my neck and I had to concentrate what I was doing. I could still always enjoy the show, but you know, Rival Sons is just amazing live. You know, How fun and epic were those golden years, though? I mean, the 70s, the 80s, you shot Zeppelin, you went on tour with Van Halen numerous times, so many artists, I mean, Rat, uh, Guns and Roses, Poison, Motley Crue, just on and on and on and on. I looked at, uh, again, I've watched your documentary twice now, but it's fantastic. And people can watch that on YouTube, Amazon. No, just uh, YouTube. We took okay. it off all the paying stuff, so it's free. It's called In Your Face, the Niels Lowe's Hour Story. It's free on YouTube. It's an hour and 33 minutes. It's long, but I think... You know, Beata and Declan did an amazing job. And the editing, it's a funny video. So yeah. get primed, whatever that means, before you watch it. And watch it, and you'll have a good time. Steve Vai, Chad Smith, Joe Satriani. I mean, everybody's in it, too. Yeah, so all my just... friends, and they're all ragging and bagging on me. <laughs> but that also shows how important you are to them because they love you and they wanted to... You know, it's hard getting those guys, no matter how good of friends you yeah, are. Yeah, well, I just called them up. I got all their number. I called them up. I mean, it's hard to say no to me because <laughs> they don't call the documentary In Your Face for nothing. Yeah. So there were only two people that didn't do it. One's a good friend of mine, Randy Johnson, who's the famous baseball pitcher, and he's a good friend of mine. I love wow. Randy. 6'10", isn't yeah, he? Maybe 6'11 or 12. But yeah. Randy, before he was a famous baseball pitcher, told me he was a photographer too. So I think he sort of, even though Randy's idolized by millions of baseball fans, I think somewhere deep down Randy sort of looks up to me on a pedestal, you know, sure. but he's great. I love Randy. He, he lives in uh, Scottsdale. Let me turn this off. Sorry, folks. Who is it? I don't know. Palm Alex Springs. Van Halen? Who knows? The AVH? So no, he's not in Palm Springs. It could be Al, but. So we yeah, have Randy and then. Nikki turned me down. Nikki Six, who was one of my closest friends in the world from like 1983 to about 86, 87. You know, myself, Nikki, and Robin Crosby were, we were yeah. the fearless threesome. So Nikki wouldn't be in it. Yeah, the Nikki I knew back in the 80s. That Nikki's a different Nikki that exists now, or at least when we did the thing. But he's great. Nikki's yeah. Nikki's an innovator. I had nothing bad to say about him. We had some amazing times together working with Motley Crue, especially in the 80s from Shout at the Devil to, uh, I forgot, the I did the album cover. I can't think. What was the next one? Circus uh, Theater of Pain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, the next one, I forgot what was after that. Was it Girls, 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 I think? I, I mean, I worked with them in their... You know, when they could do no wrong. It was yeah. always fun yeah. working with those boys. Nikki's dropped a book like every month now. <laughs> like a new well, book. he's a photographer too. So oh, Nikki shoots some great photos. I've seen his work. It's a little twisted and bizarre and Abbey normal, but, you know, that's six for you. So I mean, you brought the essence of these artists to the world. You know, you really, you, your responsibility is so gigantic. You You have to showcase these musicians and you sell their brand you sell who they are yeah, you really I, have to I, get I, it I, out of them in that photo shoot or on that <laughs> you got to capture that point one second yeah, yeah. of the live show and you got fifty thousand people yeah. yelling and well it wasn't just even the live show to me the more important photos are in my studio or location because any idiot can get a photo pass to shoot three songs of almost any band but that's, you know, that's the same. It's to get Motley in the studio, for instance, the Blood Session or Van Halen, the Raising of the Flag of Iwo Jima shoot or whatever I did with Rat or Poison. You, you know, you got to remember, I always worked with the bad boys. Yeah. I didn't work with the, the good. Yeah. Well, the, the rockers and the hardcore, you know, Slash was a good friend of mine, still is, but... 
I didn't work with the, and no offense, guys, you guys are great bands, but I didn't hang with the REO Speedwagons or the Stixes. Spread your or the, wings and fly. Yeah, or the Journeys. <laughs> I worked with the Bad Boys, you yeah. know, and I had a lot of fun hanging with the Bad Boys, and they had a lot of fun hanging with me, too. Also, in those days, when you had a photo pass, you could go anywhere in the in the the venue. You right. could go in the band's dressing room, exactly. and Start eating their shrimp cocktail. Yeah, they didn't have the different photo passes like laminates, after shows, before shows, <laughs> trim passes for the hot chicks. You know, guest family. It was one pass. So if you had a photo pass back in the Led Zeppelin Kurt days, Blanche. you could go in the band's dressing room. And I've walked in on some pretty interesting things before. I uh, yeah, who was that? I think it was Michael Anthony that said, "I'm sure Neil has a ton of photos that we would rather have burned." Yeah, I do. <laughs> I don't show those to too many people though. Just my really sick friends. Oh, we're new best. And friends, I got a lot of there. sick friends. I love your. Uh, your spot here in Hollywood too. It's a great location, and just a, everybody knows that corner there. Yeah, it's I guess. Very cool. Yeah. Um, I mean, we got to talk. We're in the room. They did. Van Halen came in here, did their initial demos with Ted Templeman. He goes to Warner Brothers. They get the record deal. They come back and Sunset Sound and bust out Van Halen one. Rodney Bingenheimer, who's also been on this show, plays them. Plays the demo of that on K Rock. Right. You know, it took them a while to be gigantic, but. It made a ruckus, and well, it changed music forever. Yeah, well, they were probably since, if you, if I remember correctly, you know, they're an American big rock band. Yeah. The, the first American big rock band before them was probably Grand Funk Railroad, which, why is Grand Funk not in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? I don't understand that. So, Did you think Jim Dandy was uh, an, an inspiration for DLR? DLR? Honestly, yeah. I'd have to say 1,000%. Yeah. The first time I saw Van Halen live, I said to myself, oh, my God, that guy acts just like Jim Dandy. And you got to remember something. Back in 1973, I did a lot of work with Black Oak, Arkansas. They were an amazing band. They have an album, Raunch and Roll Live, and that album's only got six songs. It was incredible. They had three guitarists and Jim was one hell of a showman back then. And they were a great rock band. You know? Yeah, 100%. Do you think that people just really enjoyed being around you because they would... Being you know, around me? Well, I mean, you got such intimacy, levels of intimacy with these artists where you would be hanging out and scoring with girls with them and partying with them, drinking. And scoring girls for them, too. Yeah, I mean, well, let they're not going to let anybody do that, you know? Yeah, well... You know, it's funny because you go to a show and the road crew gets there first and they want to hook up with whatever girls they can, whether they're fat, ugly, <laughs> bobby pins in their head, no teeth, whatever. OK, me, I had, let's just say, a little bit more higher taste. So at night, the tour manager would come up to me and he'd give me 20, 30 backstage passes and go, OK, Lowe's, you know what to do. They don't want to give them to the road crew because the scene after the show wouldn't be so good. But if Zlo's went and distributed backstage passes to the friendly females that wanted to get backstage, it's a whole different scene. So Roseanne yeah, bars, the road crew yeah, would get Roseanne bars like, back there. You know, that wasn't <laughs> going to happen for me. So, what was? How, do you remember how you got the gig for Van Halen? Because you came here first on Van Halen two. Yeah. That well, was the first thing you well, shot. Well, I remember exactly. So the first time I ever heard Van Halen, yeah. I was in the office, and I was listening, and all of a sudden they said, okay, new band Van Halen. I heard, you know, uh, Running with the Devil, the Air Raid Siren, and I'm like, wow, I never heard anything like this. And you got to remember, we were coming off the disco days. Yeah. Donna Summers, Village People, Saturday Night Fever, Grease. It was sort of a sad time. I mean, I liked all that stuff, too, if you want to go dancing and stuff, but I'm a rock and roller. I like rock, okay? Mm -hmm. So the first time I heard Running with the Devil and then immediately broke into Eruption, you really got me, and I'm like, I got to work with this band. So at the time, myself and a friend of mine, Barry Levine, world-famous photographer, yeah. innovator, trendsetter, he single-handedly changed the face of studio rock and roll photography we were hired to shoot a texas jam and so we go there and we were hired by the promoter so we had clearance to shoot everybody all the bands aerosmith nugent hart i think journey was there 
So I'm waiting for Van Halen on, and I'm on stage, waiting for them to get on stage because I was going to shoot him. And then this guy came and basically the most intimidating guy in the world, who it turns out to be Noel Monk, who became their manager. He saw me. He's got little <clears throat> black leather coat, black leather pants, Billy Club, mace, handcuffs, <laughs> Peter Fonda glasses. He goes, "What are you doing on my stage?" Oh, I'm going to shoot, you know, we're shooting this for the promoter, we're clear. Well, you may be clear for everybody, but not Van Halen, so get the fuck off the stage. Wow. I'm like, ooh. So I went in the audience, and I watched them, and they delivered the good. And so I went back to L.A., and they had two more shows on that tour, San Diego and Long Beach. And it turns out a friend of mine, Bob Gibson, was their publicist. So I called up Bob and said, hey, Bob, I want to work with this band. So he gave me photo passes for San Diego in Long Beach, and back then I shot the whole show. I brought the photos to the band, uh, to his office a few weeks later. The whole band was there, showed him the photos, and I guess they really never had a real photographer shoot them up sure. to that point. And they looked at my stuff and loved it. So then they were doing a session up, and uh, they were playing a day on the green in Oakland, and I flew up there and I did my first backstage shoot with them. And I guess they liked that, too. So next thing you know, we were all the same age and had a lot of things in common. How old are you then? 24, uh, roughly? 23? 24 going on 200. Yeah. <laughs> I'm old enough. That's what I tell my girlfriend's parents. So anyway, but so next thing you know, we're all hanging and getting into trouble together and just working together. It was, just became, partying, bagging girls, yeah, snorting yeah, blow, yeah, all that. Whatever everything. your mind wants to imagine, but yeah. Nice. Like I said, I hung How out with the that? bad boy. It's a lot of fun. I'm surprised I'm still alive, oh you know? Oh, my gosh. Um, so then, hey, Neil, we're shooting Van Halen 2. Can we book you for this date and go to Sunset Sound on Sunset <laughs> Boulevard? Well, you're talking about Van Halen 2 album cover shoot, or are you talking about the shoot we did here at Sunset Sound? In here at Sunset oh, Sound. Oh, they just said, hey, Lowe's, why don't you come to Sunset Sound and do a shoot? That had nothing to do with Van Halen 2. That was just, you know. But they were recording that album when you shot that yeah, in here. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Dave is a genius of controlling the media and knowing what people like. Yeah. So. You know, you got four different personalities in that band. And, you know, Eddie and Al are great musicians. And back then, everybody's a little, we were only 24 years old, whatever. So even I, like I said, was a shy kid, you know. But we, you know, Dave was the one who knew the importance of image. So Dave was the one who had all these publicity stunts. And he was the one that always wanted to shoot. And, you know, one thing, whether it's Motley or Poison or Rat, when you're starting off, you always want to do photo shoots, okay? And, you know, you want to get in the magazines. You want to open up that cream or circus or hip parade, and you want to see a picture of you or your band or whatever because, A, you know it's going to sell records, and, B, if you're looking good, you know you're going to end up with some hot chicks, you know? Yeah. So, so we <laughs> just, you know, Dave knew the importance, and we did a lot of photo shoots. And, but it's funny, like I was telling you, as the bands get bigger, they're like, they want to do less and less photo shoots. In their mind, they get to the point where they think, oh, we're too big to do this. We don't need this anymore. They sort of lose track of reality once their sort of ego set in and they've sold a few platinum records or whatever else is going on. So, Can you let everybody know that that photo that was shot right over in this corner, are we allowed to put it up so we can talk about it? You can put it up. He said we can put it up. Do you have the image or do I have to send it to you? Well, if you want Oh, that one's so old and faded. I think that's been up since 1978, that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the beer cans, they weren't partying in here at all. They were, those were all well, staged. Well, you know what? I mean, they were partying here, but that was all staged for that photo shoot. Yeah, but I came in here on a day. Look, when you're a rock band and you're paying 1000 bucks an hour to record or whatever the fee is... You you aren't recording when Neil Zlow's hour is there. You're there to shoot photos because you don't want me, as in Zlow's, to get in your way, you know, that $1,000 a day bill. So it was probably a day off, and Phil, uh, Paul was nice enough to let him use this studio, and we did a photo shoot. So, All camera But on. a lot of that, yeah, a lot of that dirt could have been there, or it could have been similar, because if you went up to 5150 to Ed's studio at his house in Coldwater when Ed was still alive, that place was a mess. I mean, you know, most guys are slobs anyway, you know. Yeah, but... 
I mean, that was his home studio. This is a, you know. A professional place. But if they had it on lockdown for a week or whatever, you know, it's like I'm sure they didn't have to take all that gear out every night and lug it in the next day because another band was coming at 8 o'clock that night. So, I mean, I just want to get the vibe of that day when you came in here. I mean, you also shot Women and Children, which I'll talk about in a little bit. But you come in to Sunset Sound is everybody here? What time is it? What's what's going on? Are you guys uh, fucking yeah, I don't remember. rails? You know, no, I don't think we were doing any blow that day, but what do you call it? Uh, and, you know, when I'm working, I work. I like to play a little too, but, uh, you know, that's 1978. So that's 88, 98, 108, 118. So that's 43 years ago I shot those photos. You know, that was a long time ago, but... It was pretty business, you know, that was probably one of the first really big photo shoots I did with the band. So I wanted to make sure everything went good and the photos looked good. So I'm sure I wasn't drinking 20 Mickey's Big Mouth beers back then, you know, maybe after the shoot was done I did, but not during the shoot. Did you, you know, your philosophy has been one light, one lens kind of. You shoot artists with one light. Right. Well, when I shoot my studio stuff, like so, you know, if I was doing a shoot, I would never light like this, you know, but I have my own unique lighting that I like compared to Barry Levine or compared to maybe Ross Halfin, great photographer, yeah, good friend of mine. Yeah. Or, you know, Mark Weiss. Everybody's got different lightings and different styles, you know. So, you know, one thing that I know is throughout my career, a lot of people have come up to me and said, you know, Slows, I can always, when I'm looking for cream or I'm looking to do circus or operator and I get to one of your photos, I don't even have to look at the photo credit because I can tell by your lighting yeah, uh -huh. and how the band looks and the cheekbones and everything that you shot that photo. You know? Stick your chin out. Yeah. Lean exactly. into me. Stick your chin out. I showed you that earlier when I told you I was going to be leaning like that. Not like that, <laughs> but like that, so. On tour, um, well, first off, I want to just, let's go speed round and rip through some artists, and if okay. you could just tell a cool story on each one of these. Okay. Led Zeppelin, you shot that infamous Jimmy Page photo. Was that at the forum? Which Jimmy Page photo? The one that's, um, he's got the guitar, and he's... I don't, I don't know. <laughs> have to show. Got the guitar. I thought you were talking about the Jimmy Page photo with Laurie Maddox. No. <laughs> Well, that's pretty good. Yes. I'm talking about the one. I think it's at the forum, and he's uh, leaned back. He's got the guitar almost laying flat. I'll have to put it out. Are you sure it was me? It doesn't sound familiar. It's in your documentary, too. They talk about it at the beginning. Well, I got one that's the heart photo where at the end of the, the bow, I always liked Jimmy using the bow. Yeah. That was always, I couldn't wait for Jimmy to use the bow. Yeah. All right. Ozzy Osbourne. Ozzy, uh, but are you talking about certain photos or just working with the artists? Uh, yeah, what's the story that you have from Ozzy? You know what? I never worked much with Ozzy. I've done some shoots with him, 88, 89, 91, and then I did a big shoot, I think the weekend before 9-11, where I, they had a rental studio, not Ozzy, but the record company, and had every hour was a different photographer using it. I never had a problem with Ozzy, yeah. and a lot of people think he's brain dead, but every time I worked with Ozzy, he was a pleasure to work with. Every time I told him some, raise your chin, do this, do that, cross your arm, he did exactly what I asked him to do. He was fine. I yeah. never had one problem working with Ozzy. Um, hopefully this comes out. He was just in Studio 3 right here. Mm -hmm. You know who's in Studio 3 today? No. <laughs> really? That, no, to, I, that to me is, well, we won't name the band. I don't know. That to me is depression rock. Oh, you know, I if you're going to commit amazing. suicide or whatever, and you want to listen to some good music to be in a downer, just bad mood, that's the band. And I'm not going to say who it is. I do like the drummer, though, because he's a BMW motorcycle fanatic, yeah. and I haven't seen him for a while. But mm. He's at the Big Potato all the time playing with some other bands, yeah, too. Yeah, he's I, good. Yeah. Um, all right. So did you see Van Halen back in the days with uh, Gazzari's, Starwood? No. You didn't see many of those places? The first time I think I ever saw him, a girlfriend of mine, she used to work at the Whiskey, and she used to tell me, you got to see this band, 
Van Halen. You got to see this band, Van Halen. So, so we went to the Starwood once. Okay, you and it was go. probably 77, 78. Yeah. And that was the good old 714 Quailu days. And I think I took a couple before I got there. And we went upstairs to the VIP room. And I remember probably popping a loo, drinking a few beers. Band hit the stage. All I remember is waking up going, oh, that band wasn't so good. You know, just uh. like slept through the whole thing. So, but I have a lot of bootlegs of them from their earlier days. And a lot of the stuff they used to play was covers, you yeah, know, like time. Bad Company and Kiss. ZZ Top and stuff like that. They were uh, the backyard party yeah, rock the, cover band. Well, they're, they're they a money. party band. You know, just like when I first started working with Poison, their first album, I heard something. They were still on Enigma Records. They weren't on Capitol Records when I discovered Poison. I won't say I discovered them, but when... I discovered their music, yeah, and I sure. thought that first album's just phenomenal. Just, just it's party music. You want to be in a good, uppity mood. You put something, or even Rat was like that too. You know, Qu time. Quiet Riot. You know, with the with Frankie and uh, Rudy and Carlos. That was good. To have fun. You know, feel good music. That's what I like. You know, how many? Uh, well, let me go back here. So Ozzy. Poison, uh, you shot them early on in their career as well. Poison, right? yeah. oh yeah, those are good friends. You're still to this day. You see, him uh, I see I Ricky. Know. He's a big motorcycle fanatic. I don't think uh, Brett likes me too much, even though I got no problems with him. Uh, Bobby, I think moved to Florida. I haven't seen him. CC, I don't know where he is, but I, I don't see those guys too often. I see Ricky once a year, which I'll probably see him Sunday. Because there's a once a year English motorcycle ride put on by the Norton Owners Club, yeah. and I see him almost every year at that. You so. collect bikes too, don't you? Yeah, I got one or two. Uh, how much does that mean? Like fifty? Not that much. <laughs> Not that far off though. Guns and Roses, yeah. just a pinnacle LA band. Axel Rose is actually from near where I am in Indiana. I yeah, Chicago. I know because I was shooting Aerosmith when Guns and Roses was opening from in Indiana. And I remember after the show backstage, all Axel's relatives were there. So, wow, what a memory. So, yeah, that's honestly, it's like, you know, just like AD and BC, you know, before Christ and whatever AD stands for. I'm not the most intelligent guy when it comes to stuff like that. But there's before guns and after guns. Yeah. So guns, when they came out of the shoot, all rock changed after there. So you had the hair bands, Poison, Rat. When I shot Guns the first time, they came in. And, you know, Axel's hair was poofed up, but it just, all of a sudden, after Guns started taking off, which actually took quite a while, too. Everybody thinks these bands like Van Halen and Guns N' Roses broke overnight. Quiet Riot, same thing. Quiet Riot, it took a long time for that first album to sell whatever was four mil or whatever. But so, you know, after Guns, all of a sudden, a lot of the bands, they weren't going to those clothing designers anymore to have their stage clothes made. And all of a sudden, all that hairspray wasn't coming. That, that stuff was coming down. No more poofed hair. It was more natural and rock and roll after Guns. You know, they were really innovators. Them and Metallica, I got to say. Back in... 86 i worked with guns i think in 87 for the first time and i think metallica opened for ozzy i saw him in 86 wow. at long beach and that's when the audience for metallica destroyed the long beach arena they started pulling the chairs oh, yeah. out of the ground and it was they, someone they, died didn't they I don't know if anybody died, but there was over like $100,000 worth of damage to the arena. Not during Ozzy, but during Metallica. No, but the whole show had to close down after like three songs for some reason. No, it was longer than three songs. Uh, okay. It was death-defying. Yeah, oh, yeah, I oh, was there. Shit. I was wow. there. Wow. I just remember seeing that or hearing about that in the documentary and all the VH1 yeah. stuff they've done behind the music. The crew... You shot them at Cherokee Studio? Everywhere. You shot them uh, a lot. The first time, first time I shot them, I think it was at Perkins, maybe Perkins Palace. They were rehearsing for some Santa Monica Civic gigs that they were going to do. And my friend Barry Levine, the trend-setting photographer who I knew since the 
early 70s. He was sort of managing them at oh, the really? time before Doc and Doug, Doc McGee, world famous manager. So Barry's like, Neil, I'm working with this band, Motley Crue. You want to come down and meet them and possibly work with them? And I went down to SIR when they were on Sunset. And I walk in, and they were playing so loud. They were rehearsing. And I walk in with Barry, and they looked at me, and they didn't even, like, give me the time of day. They looked at me like, who the fuck is this guy, you know? But yeah. then they continued, and the rehearsal was over. And then for some reason, me and Nikki just hit it off. I don't know why. I mean, all the guys were cool. You know, they had the baddest of the bad boy image. But all the guys were cool. But for some reason, me and Six just hit it off. And then soon we became best of friends. I used to have to break into Nikki's first house because Robin Crosby lost the key. And Nikki was on tour. And I used to go up there every day and feed the cat. So when I was a kid, there was a show called It Takes a Thief. And Alexander Mundy, I think that was his name, used to take a credit card and go in the window and lift the latch up. And I had to do that every day at Nikki's house, break into his house with the credit card, lift the window up, go in through his garage to the living room and feed Nikki's cat. Where was, was he living behind the whiskey there? Didn't no, that no, place that was, this is after, this is when he started making a oh, little okay. bit of money. I think he either bought or rented a house on Lookout Canyon. Gotcha. So, so. um. Did you go on the road with them as well? Sometimes? Oh, yeah, tons of time. That was always fun. <laughs> you could see by the dumb look on my face. That was a lot give, of fun. Give us a story on the road well, with Molly well, Crew. What, what kind of stories? I mean, the girl that you had to three way with Nikki while you're doing a rail. No, I just have a couple midgets and no, no midgets. Or small people, that was, sorry. Uh, look, listen, <laughs> all I can say is all the bands I toured with, there was never a shortage of girls. And I mean, hot girls. You know, when, when grunge came in, in 91, 92, you know, back in my day, the girls, when they'd go to show, they'd make themselves look as hot as possible. They wanted to get fucked, okay? They were me the suck me, fuck me pumps, the shortest dress, the shortest hot pants, whatever. Then grunge came in, and the philosophy is, okay, let's see how ugly I can make myself look. So they'd go down to the market and they'd buy an old burlap bag that some <laughs> potatoes came in and cut some hole and wear that, some dress that was like that. <laughs> then they'd stick pins in their <clears throat> head. It was like, let's see how ugly. They probably didn't bathe for a week. I mean, that's not what I look for in a girl. I am skinny and sexy and yeah. hot and sort of slutty and, you know. That's well, what do you think about like cancel culture today? You know, cancel it's like, culture. You, you know, I don't even know about. what that is. Oh, come on. I mean, everybody gets canceled. If you, my friend of mine works on, or he was an actor on a TV show, he he grazed a girl's breast and they fired him off oh, CBS. God. And uh, you, I mean, you, you know, I said this girl, I met her at the girls, girls, girls video, Monique Bifignani. And I met her there, and all the other girls on the set, they were all these blondes, and they were all mm -hmm, dancing like that, big fake tits, you know, bouncing up and down. Monique just got up there, and she was sort of like, mm. <laughs> So I went up to her, I'm like, hey, what's your name? Oh, Monique, what do you do? Well, nothing, I'm just sort of an extra on this thing. You're going to come work for me, okay? So, you know, and she, she worked for me in the 80s, probably 87, let's just say. Yeah, that was pre-marriage and stuff. It was a lot of fun. But, you know, back then, they didn't have any sexual harassment things because I always had girls working for me. I'd be in jail for the rest of my life if they had that shit going on. Yeah, you know, back outrageous. When, when they worked for me. Outrageous. But out of all these groups, you know, Guns N' Roses, Motley Crue, Rat, Frank Zappa, whoever, Van Halen were the craziest. I mean, well, they just did things. They, they, yeah, they did things that I've never done with other bands. And such they, as, oh, I can't go into that. I mean, so, give me a little I, bit. I don't know what the, the statue of limitation is for getting thrown in jail, yeah. but it, it's just no. There's that. Sometimes Alex's imagination. You know, Dave was doing his thing. It was all for Michael was married. So, you know, to Sue, he's still married to Sue. She's great. Yeah. Michael's, the, you've seen him in my documentary. He's fantastic. Yeah, he's fun. Amazing. And Eddie, you know, once he met Valerie, then that took him out of commission. Dave was doing whatever we 
thought he was doing back then, usually hanging with hot chicks. And me and Alex used to hang a lot, you know. So, And Alex used to be a pretty sick puppy, let's just put it that way. But he's a drummer. So, you know, drummers, <laughs> I hate to say it, all you drummers out there, but they're my favorite people in the world to big on, whether it's Al or... Tommy Lee or Bobby Blotzer or whoever, you know, Steven Adler, you name it, you know, you know, Frankie Benelli, rest his soul, you know, I mean, I just love picking on drummers. They're such easy targets. You, know? you still talk to Alex Van Halen. Yeah, I still talk to Al. How's he doing? He's doing good. You know, the death of his brother really hit him hard. I mean, those two were yeah. like really, really tight knit brothers, but you know, Everybody used to just pull Ed in every direction possible. I mean, you know. When was the last time you spoke with Eddie? Back in the last 90s? Time I, yeah, la no. Last time I spoke with Ed was the night I had dinner with him and my friend Michael Carlin, who was his business manager and Van Halen's CPA. Well, my, uh, my book was going to come out, my fifth book, uh, Eddie Van Halen, A Visual History. And me and Ed and I think his wife, I don't know, and really I can't remember her name. And uh, So it was probably 2009 the oh, last time I gotcha. spoke to Ed. Really? Yeah. What was he like? I mean, uh, when off stage, off not being at Well, Van there were Halen. so many different, just like Dave. You got Dave, who I know, and you got David Lee Roth. Yeah. Well, David Lee Roth is not the greatest person to hang around with. Dave... He used to come to my house. We'd go next door, Dolce, drink at the bar. Then we'd go to, I forgot the sushi bar on La Cienega, but it was a great place. And he was great, you know, but yeah. everybody's got to, you, you know, there's the Nikki Six rock star, and then there's the Six My Friend. You know, everybody's different. So, you know, you get different Zloses and stuff. But, you know, when I first met Ed, he was just a little innocent kid, you know, and and you'd go up to him, and he's like, oh, Slows, I love you. And he'd grab you, and he'd be slobbering on you and kissing <laughs> you and hugging you and everything like that. And even the last time I saw Ed, one of my memories is that, you know, we're leaving the dinner, and he's like, oh, man, I love you. He grabbed me so tight that I usually have glasses hanging from my shirt, and he broke the glasses. He gra he hugged me so tight. So That's what everybody said, that he liked to give the big bear hug. Yeah, and... he's drooling, slobbering on you, kissing you. But I've had my moments with Ed, too, where I had to sort of ream him a new butthole and hang up the phone on him, but he wasn't doing so good in that period of his life. Well, Dweezil Zappa sits in on this uh, all the time, and his dad did Hot Rats in this room. Uh, in yeah. It's one of the best songs. I know that. I have that album. Yeah, well, Captain Beefheart's on the album, all, all right. these people. Um, but he said the same thing. You know, he also said that when Frank Zappa died, Eddie Van Halen was the first one to call him at 6 in the morning. Yeah. And I think it was because he had been up. For, it could have been. Yeah. Eddie's, yeah, Eddie liked to. Well, everybody knows that he had an extreme problem with drugs. Yeah. Did you go to 5150? I've been there quite a few times. I didn't really work with the band after Dave left. So after 1984 tour, when Sammy got in the band, I didn't work with Van Halen from... 85 to about 94 because their new manager ed leffler who used to manage sam before sam got in van halen yeah. he became their manager when uh, when sam got in the band so they tried to clean house of all the old people that wow. worked with the dave day so everybody Rudy Liren, you know, Eddie's Tech, gone. You know, Larry Hosler, gone. Me, gone. I just a photographer, gone. But the only one who stayed was Al's drum tech because Al and Greg Emerson, they were like best friends. But from what I hear, everybody made Greg's life so hard that eventually Greg just said, I can't deal with this. You know, they, they made his life so miserable they just didn't want to be there anymore, no matter how much Al loved Greg, you know. I mean, you were kind of their staff photographer, too. You would do everything for them, for Van Halen. Well, they didn't really have a staff photographer because you really don't want to, being a band, you don't want to work with just one photographer. And you can't do that. You know, certain magazines, like, if I was their staff photographer and Rolling Stone said, we want to put you on the cover, well, Rolling Stone's going to have their own photographer they want to pay and hire because this guy th is cool with Rolling Stone or whatever. So... I did a lot of the work because we were all close friends. Yeah. And I had contacts with magazines all over the world. So instead of like what you don't want to do when you're a band is have 
every magazine that wants to run a story on you have their photographer shoot you because you're going to end up with shitty photos, you know? Yeah. So they knew that if I shot them, I would watch out for certain things like double chins. And when just the band didn't look good, I wouldn't let those out. You know, if they had a rough night and they had bags under their eyes, I'd know how to light them or do whatever to make them look good. So if you got bags under the eyes, you overexpose. Well, you could do a few things. You know, you just light it a little different. I mean, there's not much you could do other than makeup, really. But, you know, yeah, I'm talking more like double chins and things like that. Is there anyone you've wanted to shoot in your life that you haven't? I mean, if you go in online and look at Niels Lozauer's, the artist, bands, people, it's pretty much every major <laughs> group, band, artist yeah, ever. Pretty, I mean, the only ones I Jimmy can Hendrix? think of. I, w I saw Jimmy four times, but I wasn't shooting photos yeah. back then. But the three bands that come to my mind, I probably could have shot Elvis, but I was never a big fan, okay? Yeah. Just not, you know, my cup of tea. Grateful Dead, not my cup of tea. And the Beatles, and I wasn't around for the Beatles, yeah. you know? Wow. But if you said, Neil, if you could work with anybody you never worked with, who would it be? It would probably be Jerry Lee Lewis. Cause, wow. Because I, I love that guy. I think his music's incredible. I mean, I love Little Richard, who just passed away. Jerry's pretty old. But, I mean, I got some amazing Jerry Lee Lewis documentaries, and I got a shitload of his music on my iTunes live. I, I love the guy. I think he's phenomenal. He's a, a badass motherfucker like I like to think I am. So, you know, he didn't take no shit from anybody. Yeah, so. Little Richard works in this room too. Uh, he he was great. You know, those are the kings of rock and roll. You know, people. Oh, Elvis was the king. He never wrote any of his songs. How can you be the king of rock and roll? You know, these guys felt this. You know, you know, things like Lucille or whatever. Oh, you know, yeah, Golly Miss Molly. And yeah, I'm from Chicago. Also, the blues world, you know, how much that was ripped off for even the Stones and yeah. artists even today. I mean, the new Black Keys album, that's all Delta blues licks. Yeah, I, I, you know, I listened to a lot of gospel music and then Mahalia Jackson, Pop Staples, Nina Simone. Been getting into a lot of that stuff. So. Nina's sick. Um, what's one of your biggest inspirations, Jim Marshall? Oh, without a doubt. As far as photography is yeah. concerned, you know, so I mean, Jim to me, was the greatest rock and roll photographer that ever lived. But he lived also in a different era when rock and roll photography was different because he was more of a documentary type of photographer. You know, Jim would go live with someone, Miles Davis or whoever was it, Cream or Jimi Hendrix, and he'd hang with them, go to the market with them, sleep on their floor. Now it's like, okay, Neil, you got a photo session with the Red Hot Chili Peppers. They're going to come to your studio at 12.09 p.m., and you got them till 12.37 and 50 seconds <laughs> p.m. So you can do whatever you want with them in that, you know, 38 minutes and 19 seconds time. So, you know, back then, that's why Jim's photos are just incredible. Yeah, he shot so much great stone stuff in here. And it's it's just like you said, you know, he would hang out with them. What, but you did that also with Van Halen and stuff. You'd be on the road yeah. and living with them and partying and yeah. tag teaming girls with them. And oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, back then, you know, earlier you said there's no more money in f photography. Right. And, you know, back in the day, all you had was these publications, Cream, Rolling Stone, you get big bucks for the cover of Rolling Stone. No, Today you get... Not, not really. I don't think you ever got big bucks. People think so because Rolling Stone has this such a prestigious image. I've had covers of Rolling Stone, so I know what they pay. I don't want to get into specifics because what I get could be different than what sure. someone else gets. You know, people call me up, hey, Neil, someone wants to buy this photo. How much should I charge them? I'm like, look, what I charge and what you charge are two different things, you know? So, but I try to help the, you know, so many young aspiring photographers have come to me for help. And even the old moldy guys that are even older than me, sometimes they call me up, Neil, you know, some, someone wants to buy this print. How much should I charge them? Someone wants to use it for a double page in this magazine. How much should I charge them? I try to help them, you know. Why is there no money in uh, photography in 2021? Well, because first of all, there's digital cameras. Mm -hmm. It doesn't take any, uh, any knowledge or wisdom or any talent 
to shoot a good photo. Yeah. I mean, you know, like I tell people, I could be shooting, some new guy could be shooting a photo you drew. And right behind, I'm looking, and here's all these light stands in the background coming out of the middle of your head. I'm like, hey, Joe, don't you see those light stands coming out of Drew's head? Oh, Neil, don't worry about that. We'll just get rid of them later in Photoshop. Yeah. So there's no attention to detail anymore. Or, you know, there you, some guy could be at the park and then a block away there's a big tree or a light pole coming out of his head. Or, you know, someone's doing this and you got five chins there. And, they, they're, you know, there's no even interaction anymore with the subjects. Like I said, you could tell I got a big mouth. So I'm always grinding the people and telling them what to do and yelling at them and screaming at them. And I'm trying to pull out whatever I can from their personality. Nowadays, it just click, click, click. Click, click. There's no international. So you could be Slash, and Slash doesn't really move that much anyway. He's a great guitarist and a good friend of mine, and I love the guy. But, you know, it's, these people need a little help because they're musicians. They aren't professional models who know how to get up there and pose. Yep. So, But, yeah, being a photographer, just I haven't probably shot a camera in two years, uh, shot a photo in two years. Well, you got to take one of me before you leave today so I can say Neil's a little With your take... iPhone? Oh, I got a nice Lumix Panasonic. I would probably even know how to use that thing. What year did you go digital? Probably about 2000. Well, oh, really? I went digital in my studio first, but I was still shooting photos like at House of Blues live with film. And you could always tell when Zlo's was at a show because in the pit, you know, back in the 70s or 80s, everybody was shooting film, so there'd be 50, 100 empty film boxes. In the 2000, <laughs> like, five, six, seven, eight, the only film boxes in the pit on the floor were my film boxes. Everybody else was digital, you know, so. But, you know, p clients, let alone do they not even want to pay for photographers anymore, yeah, I mean, the, the, you know, we used to charge them back for the film and processing. Yeah. It was $30 a roll. So if I shot 10 rolls, it'd be $300 just for the expenses. They don't even want to spend $300 to pay the photographer now. So they definitely don't want to pay for film and processing. So I basically had to go digital. Yep. Because if I said, well, it's $300 for film and processing. What do you mean 300 Aren't you digital? No, I'm film. Oh, well, forget that. You know, we need the photos, you know, by... It's uh, you're gonna do the shoot at 4 p.m. We need all the photos by 6 p.m. So there's no way to do that except digital. Yeah, you know I I went to film school a long time ago. I went to I understand uh, being a gaffer. Why? What was your philosophy of one light? And when you're in the studio? Well, basically, I mean, you know, if you go outside, there's one light, Mother Nature, the sun. So, and I'm talking about the main light to light people. Mm -hmm. But first of all. I just like that look because I know how to use it to give people good cheekbones and, you know, and, and to give them basically one chin instead of five chins, you know, so. How, how is uh, the paparazzi taking uh, a, a piece of the pie here in photography when... Is it because they're going around looking for Alec Baldwin right well, now? They, rather than... they didn't take any piece of the pie as far as I'm concerned. I mean, paparazzis, yeah, they serve... A spot in photography but I won't say they aren't real photographers but if you put those photo photographers in a studio with studio lights and said okay do a studio they wouldn't know what they're doing they're used to shooting photos with a on-camera flash and they don't do any thinking it's all auto focus auto exposure the camera knows how to regulate how much light the flash puts off so there's no thinking involved that's just being at the right place at the right time and having the right access at that moment what do you think about social media giving photo credit i have a lot of friends that are photographers and it's like even justin bieber he takes their photo he gets photos from a photographer he won't even give him photo credit well, I mean, if I see, if you see somebody on social media, some let's well, not slash, but somebody of that nature, and they're using a Lowe's photo, mm -hmm. and they don't even mention who shot it, that pisses. Oh, you. it happens all the time. Uh, Doesn't that make you pissed off? Uh, uh, that's my I've work. Been I've been doing this so long. There's other things that piss me off, but there, you know, I don't go on Facebook. I yeah. hate Facebook, so I can't stand it. People are like, hey Neil, I said you. 
a message on Facebook, but you never replied. <laughs> I don't go to Facebook. I don't look at Facebook. Oh. I go to Instagram, and that's mostly to look at all the hot chicks I know. And there's quite a few of them I know on Instagram with some great photos. But, you know, there's a slash legacy site. He gives me photo credits. There's a lot of Eddie Van Halen sites and Van Halen sites. They all rip me off, and they never give me photo credit. And a lot of times I've gone to Instagram, and I've had whole sites pulled down before. But whatever, you know. Uh, you you have the great Eddie Van Halen book, which you're doing another one now. What's the name of the first one to plug? The if first book, it, I think, is called out. Edward or Eddie Van Halen, A Visual History, 1978 to 84. So I have another book I'm working on now. I just finished it, basically. It's got to go to the printer in Asia, but that one's going to be called Ed by Lowe's. And it's got all photos that were never in my first Van Halen book. They were never in my Eddie Van Halen book. And whereas in my other books, I have quotes from musicians like David Coverdale or Stephen Piercy or whoever talking about what Van Halen meant or what Eddie's guitar player meant. This one is going to be all my sort of story of working with Van Halen and how it all came about and different stories behind different photos in the book that people had misconceptions about these photos. So I'm setting the record straight now on this last book. I never thought I'd do another book, but people can't get enough of Ed. They want to see Ed shots, you know, so I'm going to give them some shots that were never published before and wow. definitely not in my books. What'd you record those bootlegs on of the shows back in the day? Just a little Oh, I didn't record them. Oh, you just kind of acquired them. Yeah, yeah. I'm, gotcha. I'm a collector. I mean, I listen to music from when I'm in the morning brushing my teeth in the shower to at my studio all day long. I, I listen to music all day long. Yeah, I got to come visit your studio. Uh, Niels Lozar on Instagram is just at Zloz, Z-L-O-Z. He's got a cool page. Um, Are you sure that's what it is? I don't know what my Instagram yeah, is. it is. Let's peep Hold it real quick. <laughs> Let me see, because there's some phony Lozauer pages, too. I was just looking at here. See, this oh, it's at Niels Lozauer. Yeah, see, I don't know. See, this is what I go on to look at. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> So. If you're hot, uh, D DM Neil at Neil's at Neil's Lozar. Yeah, preferably uh, Asian. You know, the purpose of this whole show is because we're celebrating 60 years at the studio, and I, there was no cameras around, no video cameras, no nothing that yeah. documented this stuff. So I'm like, why don't we bring the people that did significant work in here, and we'll talk about it and just, you know, I really think that I don't have any kids, but a lot of my friends do, and you know, they come in here, they don't know the, who the doors are, well, and that fucking blows my mind. So. Yeah, kid, um, kids don't know. No. no, well, I mean, with cool stuff like this, we can, you know, keep it alive and keep it interesting and document it mm -hmm. from the people that actually did it. Mm -hmm. um, so what I do is, you know, I pump you on social. <laughs> I pump you. Uh oh. I, mm -hmm. <laughs> I pumped you. Yeah, watch on, your words <laughs> <laughs> on, on our Twitter and Instagram because I want to hear what other people want to ask you. So we're gonna fire through just eight or ten questions okay, here. Okay, great. Let's then, let's do this. Did Drew. you uh, this? First one is, f uh, did you ever shoot for Playboy or Hustler or anything of that, along that magnitude? Good question. Mm, like I've had photos in Playboy magazine when they used to do music reviews. I never shot any naked girls. Gotcha. Well, never shot any naked girls for Playboy or Hustler, let's just say for my own personal collection. But no, I never did any nudie girly stuff for them, if that's what you're getting at. Uh, yeah, I think that's cool, though, because they do do a lot of different stuff i mean back in the 70s and 80s hayes lowe's big fan drew can you ask him to share a story story about shooting the red hot chili peppers did they come to your studio or you shoot them i never shot the red hot chili peppers is a band mostly chad I, uh, right? chad's a good friend of mine he's in my documentary if you want to see a crazy zany guy watch my documentary because chad's scene is probably my favorite scene in the whole movie but uh and flea's great i mean Flea used to eat at a restaurant across the street from my studio called Joseph's Cafe. And one day we were at a gig and he's in front of 18,000 people and Flea leans down to me in the photo pit and he goes, hey, did you hear that Robert just had a baby? And Robert was the owner of Joseph's. So that was great. And then once I was at a party for Slayer that this girl threw at the, uh, I forgot, the Magician's uh, Magic Castle oh, yeah. in Hollywood, suit and tie place, but Slayer Party. So 
the girl whisked me in. Everybody was lined up waiting for a magic show. And the girl whisked me in the back way and sat me and my future wife, who was pretty smoking, you know, at the front row. And all of a sudden, next to her was Anthony. And Anthony was hitting on her the whole night. We were just the three in there at the time, but he was hitting on her. And then Chad, I got 10 million Chad stories, you know, how I helped him put disc brakes on his Mustang. And then I'm under his car. And one of my Asian girlfriends came over, and she's sitting at the table one here. Of my- <laughs> <laughs> and I can't see what they're doing. And then she came over to my house later, and she goes, you know, Neil, your friend, you were under, you know, Chad's car working on his brakes, and he's sitting here, sitting down, whipping his dick out and swinging it around in my face and shit like that. So I love Chad. Chad's one of my favorite characters in the whole world i i haven't seen him for ages but the guy's just the wackiest guy so out of all women uh asian women are kind of your my girlfriend's asian kyoko uh i prefer exotic looking girls yeah Yeah, nice this guy's name is dan ratner isn't that no uh, that's dan rather on you know (laughs) Yeah. Listen to this question. Zlows, we had a three-way with a girl at my house in East Hollywood on Vermont in 1987. Dan Ratner. Doesn't sound familiar. All right. <laughs> uh, I'm never in any three-ways with two guys and a girl. Put it that way. Okay. It's maybe two girls and a guy or three girls and me or four girls and me. But Zlows, I loved your documentary. What's a good shutter speed to have when a band is full-on rocking at the Forum? Well, that all depends on what the lights are, but usually the lights are good, so you can use a higher shutter speed. And with digital cameras, you can get away with a really high ISO, like five, ten thousand, and still get good quality. Back in the film days, you really didn't want to push the film past 1600 ASA, and that was about the limit. So 10,000, you'd have 16, 32... 64, say 12 thou, that's a four stop. So where I was shooting at F2 or 2.8, you could be shooting at F5, 6, or 8. Amazing. Thank you, sir. All right, we got just a few more questions. Lowe's, what was the attraction to start shooting Van Halen, and did you have any idea they were going to become the mighty Van Halen back in the club playing days? You don't really remember much from the Starwood, but when you were even here on Van Halen 2, yeah. were you like, fuck, these guys are awesome? Well, yeah. I mean, all I had to do was hear Running with the Devil and Eruption, and you really got me for the first time. And I was like, you know, one of the things about being a successful photographer is not how great of a photographer you are, but how great of a business person you are. To me, that's more important than being a great photographer. But also important is to be able to call the bands that you think are going to be the next future Stones and Zeppelin because you need to start working with them at the beginning of their career. Once they make it big, all the parasite maggot leech photographers come out. And they, of course, when you're big, everybody wants to work at you. But when you're small, no one knows you and they don't really want to work with you. So... I've always made a point to try to go what bands are going to be big. I mean, I called Ted Nugent, I called Black Oak, I called Aerosmith, called Tom Petty, called Choir Riot, Rat Poison, Motley Crue, Guns N' Roses, Van Halen. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, That's like Rodney Bingenheimer. You know, he just had an ear for, you know, in this small kind of little guy, very quiet. I know Rodney very well. I sold shots to his documentary, I think, Mayor of Sunset Strip yeah. or something. I still see him driving around in his blue GTO. Yep. Uh, I he, If you go to Canners any night, he's there at yeah. 8 p.m. He yeah. used to be at the Denny's over yep, here. Denny's. On, uh, well, he still goes there. Yeah. Uh, Neil, I'm a photographer and also a recovering drug addict. Did you ever have any issues with drugs or alcohol and miss photo shoots and make a fool out of yourself? Your work is such an inspiration. Well, like David Lee Roth used to say, yeah, I used to have a drug problem. Now I can afford it, you know. But look, everybody likes feeling good, okay? I've done my fair share of drugs. Did I have a problem with it where I'd miss gigs and stuff? There's been a few gigs I didn't want. The one I remember the most 
is I stood up with my future wife one night doing blow all night long, and I had a big shoot with the Nelsons. Oh, wow. And I didn't want to do it. I don't think I got one hour of sleep, you know? And I'm not one of these guys to do a three-day binge, but I could party with the best of them. Like I said, I used to hang with the bad boys. but And I showed up at that shoot, and, you know, once I get that camera in my hand and the adrenaline's going and I go into work mode, yeah. I'm fine. I may pass out after, but those photos, I think, you know, Matt and um, Gunner still tell me that was probably the best shoot they ever did. They they probably got laid left and right from that shoot. They they looked, I mean, in their day, the, the Nelson twins, they could do no wrong. Uh, Neil, last question. You make the artists come alive to the world so much. I made what? You made the artists uh-huh. come alive to the world so much. What was the challenge with Nirvana? We didn't talk about that yet, did he? Nirvana was kind of a dud photo session. Yeah, it was probably the worst photos. They just, like I said, when I shoot, I like to have the band's mind focused on me and what we're doing. We're there to be productive. I'm not there to like, you know, this isn't a game for me. Like, you know, if I want to play games, I'll go bone some chick or something like that or, you know, whatever. So I went to the sports arena. I had an assistant who I was paying. I probably brought about $400 worth of film at that time. It was before digital. And my friend introduced me to the band. He was their manager. And basically, he he introduced me to Kurt. And I met Kurt. And I'm like, hi, Kurt. My name is Neil Zlozauer. I've been doing this a long time. And we're going to go shoot here. And then then we're going to go five feet here. Then we're going to go 10 feet here. And, and crew was like, and I'm like, well, what, what planet's this guy on? And so once the other two guys came out, we started shooting, and it just, it was like I wasn't there. So they were just like talking to themselves, and they weren't looking in the lens. And I always like my subjects looking in the lens. I'm not Engaged, one of these guys yeah. where I want one guy here and one guy there and one guy here. And there's just, I shot one roll of film and basically said, okay, guys, we're done. See you later. And they were like, we're done? I'm like, yeah, see you in the next life. Bye, you know. And it was just, you know, I was can't work like that. the time you met Kurt Cobain? Huh? Was that the yeah, only yeah. time? Yeah, yeah, I never wanted to work with him again after that. Where, where was that at? It was backstage at the sports arena. They were opening up for the Red Hot Chili Peppers. Nirvana opening up for the Chili Peppers. Yeah. Wow. All right. Atlas Icons is where people can go to license and view your photos. License and view, or they can go to Zloz, Z-L-O-Z dot com. If you go there, there's something like 800 magazine covers, and there's album covers for Poison, Motley, Van Halen, Steve Vai, Joe Satter, yeah, everybody, and there's ads I've done. I like going to galleries. What's the name of a gallery or two in, in town on Melrose? You're not at Morrison Hotel. That's mostly just Henry Diltz, right? Yeah. Mr. Go to Mr. Music Head if you want to see great rock shots. It's right across from Guitar Center. So if you ever go to Guitar Center, right across the street, Mr. Music Head, and they have amazing rock and roll shots. They have some of mine. They have a lot of the best rock photography around. You wanted to be the best rock and roll photographer right. ever. Did you feel you've attained that? I don't know. You know, there was one year Cream Magazine used to have polls, best album, best live performance band, best, you know, writer, best photographer, best, you know, producer, you know. And, and I won for best photographer. So that was in the 80s sometime. But what really is the best photographer? There's photographers are out there that probably hate me and think I suck. Really? And I go look at this guy and think he sucks, and then another guy looks at him and thinks he's the greatest. So it's just personal. You know, as long as I am you know, can make a living and do what I need to do, I'm fine. So you, uh, Last question. Did you ever shoot uh, with Cameron Crowe on anything? Well, Cameron Crowe used to hang out with some photographers I used to shoot with and he lived in san diego and when i was younger and more enthusiastic i used to drive to san diego all the time so we'd always see cameron at those shows this is before he ever did fast times at Rid- 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 Well, he wrote Mark. for cream magazine he wrote for rolling stone and i think playboy when he was 14 years old i think he was start with too- cream then rolling stone? i think no. he was too above cream honestly okay, really? i can't remember it's so we're talking about 73 <laughs> 74 75 but yeah i knew cameron before he was a big famous movie you know director yeah that's amazing 
All right. Well, we put the eruption work order up. We got a hundred prints. Go on. Use the code. Use the code Neil for ten percent off. You know, I think it's so important that we talk to people like yourself because you were there, and I appreciate you coming in. We had some good Row Rose chicken today. Or oh, that was had, good. Did you have a chicken wrap or shawarma? Shawarma, chicken yeah. shawarma sandwich. It's the truth with the burnt, crunchy end pieces. Again, go to Atlas Icons or Zlows dot com. You got a new book coming out in a couple months, maybe yeah. six months. Yeah. yeah, Ed by Zlows with. Eddie Van Halen shots from 78 all the way to 97, Gary Sharon days. And you're going to come back on when that comes out and we'll plug it. I definitely it will, Drew. A lot of it. I appreciate it so much. You're a legend to me, and thank you very much. That's a roundtable. Let me see. What's her name?